the Space News in less than 60 seconds. SpaceX is now also planning with an expandable Starship, James Webb, back in action. Sierra Space deliberately blows up Space Station module. SpaceX completes 200th successful flight of a Falcon 9. The next big thing in astronomy, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope completes a milestone. NASA is now sending its first commercial moon lander somewhere else entirely. And we expect the 33 engine test of SpaceX Starship Booster 7 in the coming days. It would be the most powerful missile test ever conducted. That and much more with all backgrounds in full length only on YouTube in the Senkrechtstarter Astronautics News. Before we get to the actual space news, here's last week's launches. On Tuesday, January the 31st, SpaceX launched its Falcon 9 with Starlink Internet satellites from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Takeoff time was 5.15 CET and on that mission there was a ride share. Alongside the 49 Starlink satellites, the Spacetag Electric Alina of the orbit flew into low Earth orbit. The booster also landed successfully. It was the seventh flight. On Thursday, February 2nd at 2.58 CET, our night time, SpaceX launched its Falcon 9 from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida with 53 Starlink Internet satellites. It was the 200th flight of a Falcon 9 since the maiden flight in 2010. Congratulations SpaceX, but most of all congratulations Falcon 9. It was the fifth takeoff and landing for this booster. Before we get to the actual astronautic news, in the current technical episode about the flight path of the first Starship orbital flight, an error has unfortunately crept in. I say at minute 8 that the Starship flies between Australia and the Philippines. That meant of course Indonesia. You can tell anyone that I took a geography advanced course. Greetings go out to my geography teacher at that time, Mrs. Klein. Despite this error, the video is one of my most successful after less than a week. I reported on this last week, there was a software bug at the James Webb that temporarily disabled one of the instruments at the $10 billion observatory. More specifically, on Sunday, January the 5th, the slitless near-infrared spectrograph experienced a communications error that caused the flight software to time out. Cosmic rays have now been identified as the cause of this error. This kind of malfunction of electrical hardware is not that uncommon in space. One reason, by the way, why flight control systems are designed with multiple redundancies. After restarting the instrument, however, everything runs normally again and further observations can be made. Not 10 billion, but about 4 billion for the next big thing in space astronomy. NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. That's twice as much as originally estimated, but like James Webb, it will be worth the money. With the images, we may not be able to look as spectacularly far into the past as with James Webb, but with its specialization as a long-range infrared telescope, the Nancy Grace Roman should help to measure space-time and thus provide information about the expansion of the universe. In 2010, the US National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine recommended a telescope with the Nancy Grace Roman's capabilities as a top priority in astronomical research for the next decade. In honor of our Discord mod Roman, NASA nicknamed the telescope and Twitter account Roman. Okay, I may have fibbed a bit, but what's not fibbed, it's what major milestone have been reached here. As NASA announced on the telescope's Twitter account, Roman's primary and secondary mirror were combined. If all goes well, Roman is set to fly a Falcon Heavy in 2027. So the telescope, not our Discord mod Roman. Roman is to be positioned in the neighborhood of James Webb at the Earth-Sun Lagrange point 2. There was a sad anniversary on February 1st. Exactly 20 years ago, the Space Shuttle Columbia broke apart during re-entry over the United States. A piece of foam insulation damaged the leading edge of the Space Shuttle's orbiter during launch, which then led to the disaster on re-entry. Although the Space Shuttle was brought back into service under conditions to complete the International Space Station, space travel was to change forever. As Eric Berger of Ars Technica writes on the subject, NASA has been shaken by a catastrophe every two decades with Apollo 1 in 1967, Challenger in 1986 and Columbia in 2003. Every generation has been shocked by a devastating accident and he hopes the current generation doesn't have to learn that lesson. 
Space travel is and remains technically highly complex and potentially very dangerous. No routine and no-fall sense of security should creep in here. Karin and Tony discussed the topic in detail this week on Moon Whisper or Mondgeflüster. The link is in the video description below. Hashtag Team Space. While there were tragic setbacks in space travel in the Soviet Union and the US, the fledgling Chinese spaceflight has so far been spared from crew losses. While India is also preparing to send people into space again and again, there is a discussion in Europe as to whether or not we should try it too. As announced this week, the exploration company has raised 40 million euros in a funding round to develop its Nix space capsule. I had a very interesting interview on the subject with the founder of the exploration company and former Airbus manager Elin Ubi. I'll link you the interview in the description. Following the example of SpaceX, Elaine UB and the exploration company want to first tackle cargo transport and then crew transport with investors and government orders. A scaled down 40 kilogram prototype dubbed Bikini, in reference to the triangular shape, will fly on Ariane 6 maiden flight to test the heat shield. However, the spaceship is being developed launch agnostic, can be launched on a variety of carriers. Elaine Ubi, inspirational woman, interview, as I said, is in the description, must see. There will be no shortage of space stations for the exploration company's Nix capsule to fly to. There are currently two permanently inhabited ones in space and in the next 10 years several commercially operated ones are to be added. For Blue Origin's orbital reef, Sierra Space has just conducted another inflatable model destruction test. The beam module on the ISS had already shown that the technology fundamentally works. This was launched in 2016 and has just been certified by NASA for possible use until 2028. Sierra Space, don't they build the Dream Chaser too? Correct. It will make its first flight on the second flight of the ULA's Vulcan rocket and as revealed by the Twitter account of arguably the coolest rocket CEO, Tori Bruno himself, everything seems on track for the Vulcan's first launch. Although there's no confirmed launch date yet. Interesting that ULA markets the Vulcan as capable of rapid response, so the rocket is capable of launching a payload in a short time. According to Tori Bruno it takes 11 days from the start of assembly of the rocket to a launch. Another nice graphic helps me bring people who think space travel is a huge environmental mess down to Earth. Here Eloy puts the fuel saving through GPS satellites in relation to different traffic sectors. Of course for us Europeans it would be nicer if CO2 equivalents were given and metric units would be used, but you have to put that in a bit of a context. Although we can assume Tor Bruno is fluent in metric, the graphic is supposed to appeal to Americans and not necessarily to us Europeans. Second Vulcan flight, as I said, Dream Chaser. The first flight will launch Astrobotic's Peregrine Lunar Lander to the Moon. Astrobotic announced January 25th that it had completed testing of the lander and was awaiting the green light from ULA to send the spacecraft to Cape Canaveral for launch preparations. So there is no confirmed launch date yet, but we now know the destination of the lander. NASA announced on February the 2nd that Astrobotic's Peregrine mission will make a landing near a region called Grigruzian Domes on the northeast edge of Ocean of Storms on the western part of the Moon's near side. Also on board are a time capsule from DHL and the M42 radiation measurement sensor developed by the German DLR. Yes, that was the sensor type that flew around the Moon with Artemis 1, Insoa and Helga. I really have to ask Thomas Berger from the German DLR how the experiment turned out and whether we would all die of cancer on a deep space flight. While we are on the subject of the Moon, my episode about the Artemis 3 moon landing with the Starship is very well received by you. If you haven't seen it yet, i link it in the description below. That brings us to the SpaceX Starship news. Before the thing can fly to the moon, it first has to take off successfully. While we've been waiting in vain for a static fire test this week, the coming week could be hot. If everything goes according to plan, it would be the most powerful rocket engine test ever and would definitely take the Starship program a good step forward. On the other hand, the following information can quickly go unnoticed at first glance. The information that SpaceX Starship is supposed to be able to transport 250 tons of payload into low Earth orbit appeared almost casually on the SpaceX homepage. In the expandable version. Some critics are already skeptical that the complete reuse approach turned out to be more difficult than expected. In my opinion, however, it was clear that Starship like the Falcon 9 with partial reuse, would not be flowing completely reusable at first. 
With a payload of 150 tons, the Starship, even reusable, would be far the most powerful launch vehicle ever. But then 250 tons is a completely different house number. To put that in perspective, the ISS has a total mass of around 420 tons. This means that with two Starship flights, you could bring more mass into orbit than the entire ISS weight. Boy, that's crazy. It took 37 shuttle flights and several Russian proton launches to build the ISS. Sure, it's also about the volume, but I think you get the point. Well, first of all, the thing has to take off. The boss himself looked at the engines last week. And now SpaceX also protects the engines from the aggressive sea air. While Ship 24 and 25 apparently had their payload doors locked forever, Ship 27's door have Remove Before Flight tapes on them. There is currently speculation as to whether Ship 27 could become the first Starship carrying a payload into orbit. Then of course the Starlink Gen 2 satellites. Many thanks go to Chief for the footage from the Starbase for What About It. As a reminder, the mechanism affectionately known by the community as Pest Dispenser is intended to enable Starlink Gen 2 satellites to be ejected. For other customers or other payloads, SpaceX plans specific Starship versions for their respective tasks. Speaking of a challenging task, SpaceX is looking for qualified engineers for a crew Starship, perhaps a sign of something to be announced soon. I think we all agree, the Starship prototypes that we have seen in the Starbase so far will never carry people. But they don't have to. If SpaceX continues to produce new, more developed systems at the same pace and similar to the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon, gradually works towards responsible transport for people with the Starship, then this will be the right strategy. Before we look at the next launches, here again a big thank you to my guardian angels who support Senkrechtstarter with their regular donations. When the news come out on Sunday morning, February the 5th, a Proton M launch from Baikonur is on the agenda. A Russian Electron L weather satellite will be launched for geostationary orbit. Also on Sunday, February the 5th, SpaceX wants to launch an Amazonas Nexus communication satellite into geostationary orbit with a Falcon 9 shortly before midnight. Launch site is Cape Canaveral, launch time is 11.32 CET. On Tuesday, February the 9th, the Russian Roscosmos plans to send a Progress MS-22 freighter to the ISS. Planned launch time for the Soyuz 2.1A from Baikonur is 2.21 CET. In India, they want to send the SSLV on a test flight for the second time on Friday, February the 10th. The first flight of this rocket failed on August the 7th last year. Planned launch time is 4.48 AM CET. And then on Saturday, February the 11th, SpaceX will conclude the Senkrechtstarter week with another launch of Starlink Internet satellites. The launch is from Cape Canaveral and it's grossly early at 1 AM CET. If you like my news again, don't forget to hit the like button. And if you're new here and don't want to miss any more news from space travel, be sure to subscribe to Senkrechtstarter. Because every week on Senkrechtstarter there is news from space travel in the news and background knowledge for you in the technology episodes on how the impressive technology behind rocket launches works. I can't wait for us to take the next big leaps out there, our personal Apollo moment. If you feel the same, don't forget to like. Until next time, always stay upright. Yo Mo.